start. I hear the rolling thunder, thy power throughout the universe display. Then sings my soul, my Savior, God, to thee. How great thou art. How great thou art. Then sings my soul. This is beautiful. Wait, look at this. Oh, yeah. This is a beautiful oh, sanctuary. Oh, no, well, that's nice. beautiful. Yeah. Wow. Where are all the disciples? I thought it was rather quiet in here. Are we sure we're in the right place here? Is this Lake Ozark Christian Church? Maybe everyone is at the chapel in the woods? Well, let's go look for some disciples. Not here. 
I thought I saw someone, but it was a stump. No, nah, it wasn't the choir. It was a flock of birds. I, I don't know about you guys. Well, let's go into town, see if we can find some disciples. So I'm looking for disciples and I don't see any. Thank y'all keep looking. Yeah, I'm looking for disciples real hard right here. Not seeing any disciples. I am still looking for disciples and I don't see any. I haven't seen any either. I don't know where they are. Well, you know what I'm looking for, because I moved here because of the water. So I'm looking for the lake, and I'm looking for some disciples. And if they don't show up soon, I'm gonna go see who's walking on the water. Oh, 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 I found one. Oh, yeah, a disciple. Oh, hey, Jimmy. I find evidence of another disciple. I'm going to keep looking. Pardon me, sir, are you a disciple? I'm still looking for disciples. Would disciples be caught dead in a place like this? Maybe they're in here. You don't know me, but I need some help. Get me out of here. Hey, Jimmy, you want to come with me? Maybe they're in here with the hermit crabs. I've known some uh, introverted disciples. I don't know, Dan. Have you found any disciples? Not yet, Paul, but I'm still looking. Dan. Hey, I caught one. Live from Plattsburgh. Live from Brookfield. Live from Fredericktown. Live from Columbia. And live from the South in Springfield, Missouri. Live from Middle America. It's the 2020 Regional Assembly! Welcome to the Regional Assembly of the Christian Church of Mid-America. We are glad that you're with us today from all over this region. We hope our short time together will uplift your spirit as we connect our congregations, our clergy, our ministry groups, that together, here today, we can affirm we are better together. If you would like a docket for today's proceedings, you can go to midamericadisciples.org. That's the regional website. Many things are on that website, including what you need for today. If you have questions or want to make comments uh, during this proceeding, you can do so in the Facebook comments. If you would like to ask a specific question of myself, moderator of the region, or of our regional ministers, you may email them during this proceeding. You can email me, jimmy, at firstchristian.org. Let us turn our hearts to God. Let us be uplifted by this time together. Welcome, disciples. Hello, Mid-America disciples. This is your general minister and president, Terry Hoard Owens. And on behalf of our whole church across the U.S. and Canada, I am so pleased to bring you greetings as you begin your 2020 Regional Assembly. Across the church, we are gathering in new ways for worship, Sunday school, Bible study, church board meetings, virtual camp, and youth gatherings. We are learning new ways to be together. And hugs and fellowship hall have been replaced by shout outs on Zoom screens. But as Paul writes to the Romans in chapter 8, he tells them, We know that nothing in all creation can separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus, nor can it separate us as church from one another despite this virtual space. You as a region have declared that you are better together. And that means whether you are in each other's physical presence 
or whether the Spirit is simply connecting us across the miles, we know that God is yet with us. May this regional assembly fill your spiritual cup. May your worshipful work be done faithfully and well as you conduct your business. And may the Spirit of God be full in all of your worship experiences. I can't wait until we are all able to be together again. So in the meantime, please know that God loves you, and so do I. Have a wonderful regional assembly. Greetings, disciples. My name is Mary Robison, and I bring you greetings from the Burlington Junction First Christian Church and from the Pickering Christian Church. And I come to you from my own little personal prayer closet, my own little sanctuary. I'd like to thank the Mid-America region for inviting me and giving me the honor to pray with each and every one of you during this virtual regional assembly. It's with great humility that I ask you all to pray with me now. Dear gracious Lord and creator of all things and all people, as we gather today by the way of virtual communications, we do so with a confident knowing that you have gathered with each and every one of us in our individual homes or church locations, increasing our bond as Christ's followers. We come to you this day as a unified group of disciples. We come knowing that we are all a part of the body of Christ and that only when we work together can our work as your hands and feet be successful. We praise your name above all others as we celebrate together the life of the church and the work that you have placed before us. The work of creating justice for all, regardless of age, race, nationality, gender identity, or sexual orientation. The work of creating a world where all are welcome at your table and at each of our tables. We ask that you help us find a way to heal the hurt in our world 
through your love and our service to you. Lord, we lift up all the disciples in the 237 church congregations in our Mid-America region. From the smallest congregations in the rural setting to the largest metropolitan congregations, all of our congregations play a vital role in our region. We lift up their pastors and pastors' families and all the church leaders. We are in unprecedented times, and the leaders of our churches are being faced with some very difficult decisions that we know cannot make all people happy. Give them the strength and discernment to make the right decisions and to remain strong and closely connected to you as they serve their congregations and each person's well-being and spiritual growth at their hearts. I lift up the regional pastors and the regional staff and volunteers who have been overwhelmed, I'm sure, with the needs of these congregations and their leaders. I thank you for their undying devotion, wisdom, and service to your greater church and our region. We ask for your guidance now as we move forward in worship sessions, planning groups, missions that will help move our world in a direction that is pleasing to you. Show us your will for us, Lord, and the way to carry that out. It is in the precious name of Jesus I pray. Amen. Greetings, Christian Church, Disciples of Christ of Mid-America. My name is Derek Perkins, pastor of Centennial Christian Church in St. Louis. I'm excited to be sharing in this virtual regional assembly. Wow, a virtual assembly? I want to thank the planners for asking me to play a small role in sharing a short Bible study meditation for the day. As you know by now, our theme is Better Together, which is taken from the scroll of book of Ecclesiastes chapter 4, verse 12. I would like you to read along with me if you don't mind. The scripture says two are better than one because they have a good reward for their toil. For if they fall, one will lift up the other. But woe to the one who is alone and falls and does not have another to help. Again, if two lie together, they keep warm. But how can one keep warm alone? And though one might prevail against another, two will withstand one. A threefold cord is not quickly broken. Christian friends, we find ourselves in season in a season of adjustments. One, uh, some that are needed, and then there are those we wish we could avoid. It seems to me that the realities of our present age, such as the pandemic and its impact on human life and the community around us, the overwhelming drama and trauma associated with race, division, and injustice, the number of annoying political ads, and so much more requires that if the healing of the nation is going to be our reality, God's people will be required to be connected in ways that we have never been connected before. If our nation in every crevice and corner of it is going to be whole, the people who confess or profess to love God through loving and serving others will be forced to be together despite differences than ever before. If the church is going to be a movement for wholeness in a fragmented world, in real and contextual ways, our connectedness must be a prerequisite. All of us are needed to expand the capacity of our collective Christian witness. For we are told by the community within the Johannine tradition, according to 1 John chapter 4, verse 20, those who say, I love God and hate their brothers and sisters are liars. For those who do not love a brother or sister whom they have seen cannot love God whom they have not seen. This moment in time, we are called to be connected in greater, deeper, and more meaningful ways. We are called to see how our experiences are common in nature and how our connection to God and one another can indeed make a difference. I believe that's what Kohelet, the teacher, the preacher, 
the gatherer throughout the scroll of Ecclesiastes, interestingly wants us to make sense of in every possible way. When we think of the interesting writings of the scroll of Ecclesiastes or the book of Ecclesiastes, what quickly comes to mind are the more familiar antithetical and rhythmic scriptures that are found in chapter three. I'm sure you guys have heard those. These scriptures have become uh, famous or widely used during times of memorial services and perhaps even a funeral. You know, the scripture that says that um, everything there is a season and a time uh, for every matter under heaven. A time to be born, a time to die, a time to plant, a time to pluck up that which has been planted, a time to heal, time, 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 time. It's rhythmic and word usage reminds me of a failed hip-hop record. But anyway, it's here that Kohelet, the gatherer, the teacher, or preacher calls those who are in the assembly to consider the importance of recognizing the possibilities and realities that all of God's people uh, experience in this life, regardless of who they are, where they've been, and what one has experienced. That famous passage seems to highlight a connectedness of experiences, including those that we would rather avoid. The teacher simply explicitly suggests that the sovereignty of God is aware of, or perhaps determines life, and the experiences thereof, and we, you, me, the creation, simply lives our lives trying to discern the things of God, even when it's impossible to do so. When we think about the book of Ecclesiastes, the other well-known passage that we often hear with the sounds of wedding bells, shouts of here comes the bride, and more is the passage that seems to focus on relationships, friendships, perhaps God as a third wheel or more faithfully, the importance and benefit of connectedness. The connectedness or the lack thereof seems to be interwoven throughout the preacher, teacher, or gatherer's words in sometimes not in so coherent ways. I'm sure we would admit that perhaps that Ecclesiastes is not always our normal choice for meditation. It's certainly not the book that many of us will use to fully connect with God with the divine for some words of encouragement, it might be due to the doom and gloom of chapter one. The scroll begins with acknowledging vanity, emptiness, meaningless, the absurdity that often exists in the lives of God's people. It seems that the writer is preparing the people for the inevitable. And you know, those times when uh, God is transcendent, when God does not answer right away, when God doesn't respond to our immediate needs. The writer wants us to know uh, that, that those moments are not so easy to manage. However, those are the times whereby we connect our experiences with one another. In the Discipleship Study Bible and commentary on Ecclesiastes, John C. Holbert, a biblical scholar, suggests that Kohelet's teachings conclude that all human interaction, whether wicked or righteous, undercuts the hope of life's enjoyment. In other words, life experiences, whether good or bad, provides a common experience for us all. We're not completely sure what the historical context might have been. Some scholars suggest that the writings might be influenced by a highly charged and social political drama during the times of the Persian Empire. However, there appears to be a consensus that the writer is responding to contemporary issues of his day. He's wrestling with connectedness or the lack thereof, even when connectedness is challenging. This connectedness also exists when we all suffer from realities of the world. He would be responding if he was writing today to uh, COVID-19, the pandemic, unemployment perhaps, death, disappointment, depression, disparities, all these things that bind us together, whether it's happening in your backyard or in our backyard, the writer would say it's happening to us all. I believe Dr. King understood what it meant, <laughs> the importance of connectedness, because of his experience during the Birmingham campaign. Y'all know that letter that he wrote from the Birmingham jail? Uh, he said in that letter, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. We are caught 
in an inescapable network of neutrality tied in a single garment of destiny. The teacher or the preacher sees the connectivity even with challenging experiences. In the latter part of chapter two, near about verses 24 and on into chapter three, the writer uh, introduces God. He indicates that when God's hand is on us, life is more enjoyable or better. In other words, apart from God, there's toil, pain, a little bit of competition, injustice, and more. It appears that he presents a theology of retribution or fidelity, which seems to have some deuteromistic influence. However, he explicitly suggests that God is powerful and sovereign and gives to God's people as God so chooses. The connectedness here is that all are subject to God's power and will, which explains why there is a season and a time for everything. This is perhaps how one should understand theodicy. This is why it takes place from time to time. Why does bad things happen to good people? The lesson acknowledges that we might not like the timing of things or even perhaps the juxtaposed realities that we encounter in our world. However, we're still connected to a sovereign God who makes everything right in God's own time. This leads me to my conclusion, my friends. Like Kohelet's lived experience or the community around him, as described in chapter four, we all are still waiting for peace to be our reality, for injustice to be no more. We are waiting for the oppressed to find some compassion and some support. We are waiting for wholeness. Therefore, we are invited to stand together. Together, we might mourn and lament more faithfully. Together, we might expand our witness and reach to the world. Together, we might stand with those who are alone and perhaps lack voice. Together, we can fight and eradicate this ugly evil in our world. As long as we stay connected to one another, to the church, and yes, to God, and yes, by the way, not as a third wheel, but as the foundation of our existence, we can be and do church in more transformative ways. Fellow congregations, regardless of personality and perhaps theology, the Christian Church of Mid-America and the general church, we are better together. Let's stay connected. In my local context, there are several ministers or Lydia's who's been called from our pews in recent years because of the privilege that I have been given to be a part of their ministry formation and witness and see the creative gifts that God has so graciously given them. I am certainly stronger. Centennial is stronger. The region is stronger. And yes, our church is stronger. Dr. Coke Paul, he asked me to introduce some of them because they've been doing some amazing things and we were just wondering how and why and what God is doing in our midst or in their midst. I want to take just a brief moment to introduce the Reverend Dr. Dietra Baker, Reverend Rhonda Aldrich, Minister Linda Tobias Doss, and Edvania Scott. There are two additional people who have joined our church from another tradition. They haven't begun this process to be with you, but we also thank God for them, Sharon Mosby and Dr. Irma Perkins. I'm excited to be connected to such amazing servants of the church. We are better together. Greetings to the Christian Church of Mid-America. I'm Reverend Dr. Deetra Wise Baker. And I just came to share a little bit about my story. Uh, I came from New York, um, born to a loving mother um, who struggled with addiction and then was raised for a little while with my grandmother and then went off to school and got into the military. And that's how I got to this area in St. Louis. I was at Scott Air Force Base where I received my call to ministry um, while I was in the military and left to uh, be part of uh, seminary 
And at that time I was licensed minister. I was a youth minister in a, ch a local church in Illinois. And then I met Centennial at just a time in my life where I needed a different experience of church, a different experience of ministry where I could, you know, be with my questions. And Centennial was that safe place to nurture um, my ministry um, and the new ministry that was coming at Centennial. I had been a youth minister. Um, and so I, I was a youth minister at Centennial for a little while. Uh, and um, in the middle of that, I was in seminary and Centennial was my home church, and um, I got ordained in the Christian church, Disciples of Christ, at Centennial Church. Um, from there, I, I went, I uh, planted Liberation Christian Church, and uh, did that for 10 years after experiencing two important major church plants in my life. When I came to Christ in college, it was through a church plant. When I experienced my initial call to ministry, it was through a church plant. And so I was called to plant and I did that for about 10 years. Um, and then after planting, I went on to serve the National Church through the National Benevolent Association, which Centennial has an amazing um, history of leaders who have also served um, at the National Benevolent Association. Um, and I, I, I got the honor of joining um, that cloud of witnesses. And now I am a uh, a visiting professor of contextual education and community engagement and the director of contextual education at Eden Theological Seminary, my alma mater, one of my alma maters, um, where I get to continue um, to develop leaders uh, uh, for and with um, the church. And so uh, Centennial, uh, you know, has been a part of that journey. You still our home church um, in St. Louis. Uh, and we, um, I've had so many experiences with the national church, uh, doing anti-racism ministry and training, uh, and it's it's been an amazing time to be a part of the church, uh, to be a part of community, uh, and I believe that um, we are better together. Greetings, Christian Church of Mid-America. I am Reverend Rhonda Aldridge, pastor of New Hope Community Christian Church, where we serve in North St. Louis County. I am so excited to be a part of the Regional Assembly this year. While reflecting on our theme, Better Together, I instantly thought of where I answered my call to ministry at Centennial Christian Church under the leadership of Pastor Derek Perkins. While there, I was honored and privileged to serve as youth minister and an elder of the church. It allowed me to connect with some amazing servants who I continue to partner with today. I just celebrated five years of ordained ministry with the Christian Church, and I am currently enrolled in the Doctor of Ministry program at Eden Theological Seminary, and I also serve on the Commission on the Order of Ministry. My journey has forged several connections, connection to our denomination, connection to the region, connection to the local church, but most importantly, a connection to Christ. Being connected to these communities and experiences helped me to plant New Hope Community Christian Church where we give our heart to God, our hands to serve, with a hope to transform. In fact, connections is what makes us better together. We can accomplish more, we can imagine more, and we can implement more while working together. We are better together. Greetings, Mid-America Regional Assembly 2020. I am Linda Tobias Doss, Elder and Assistant Minister at Centennial Christian Church Disciples of Christ under Derek Perkins. I am also a women's health nurse practitioner in St. Louis inner city, helping to close the gap in health disparities. I joined Centennial Christian Church in 2007. I answered my call to ministry in 2012, and I graduated from Eaton Theological Seminary with my MDF in 2017. During my 13-year tenure at Centennial Christian Church and in collaborating ministries, I began as Sunday school teacher, and a few years later, I was appointed as chair of Christian education. 
I serve on Centennial's Women's Ministry. I serve on Centennial's Food Ministry. And I co-chair and assist Centennial's Lay Ministry. As I continue in collaborating ministries, building and seeking to be a ministries that serve the church and communities and now ordination, I look with eager anticipation to the future work and serving not only Centennial, but the regional ministries in the greater church. When I look back over those ministries, it is plain to see that through collaborations, we are better together. Greetings, my Christian Church of Mid-America family. I am Minister Vanya Scott. I am from Shreveport, Louisiana. I've been in St. Louis since 2012. I grew up about in a Baptist denomination, and in my early 30s, I joined, joined a non-denominational Pentecostal church. I am a fourth year Eden Seminary student who came to know Pastor Derek L. Perkins Sr. Um, when my progressive Christian leadership class um, met at Centennial Christian Church in October of 2018 um, to, talk about, to talk about his leadership skills or to learn about his leadership skills. Um, it is through that meeting that I was inspired of where he was leading the church and his ministry journey at the church. Um, the Spirit led me back to Centennial Christian Church in July of 2019, and in August of 2019, I joined. Um, very happy to be a member there. Um, in the church, I am now the Christian Education Chair, and outside of the church, I am looking forward to my clinical pastoral education with the Veterans Administration um, starting in October of this year. I have always had a heart for serving, encouraging, and showing love to people who are marginalized and in need. So my future goals are to continue working with those dealing with mental health issues, but also I want to add uh, pastoral care to those dealing with sex trafficking and human trafficking. Christian Church of Mid-America, we are better together. Again, I wanna thank the planning committee those who were responsible for allowing me a chance to be with you. Just want to encourage everybody. We're better together. Let's do it, church. Good morning. I'm Russell Alexander, and I was called to Red Top Christian Church in Hallsville on April 12th, Easter morning. Hello, Mid-America. My name is Mark Briley, and I'm honored to serve on the ministry team at Broadway Christian Church in Columbia, Missouri, where I've served as the lead minister since September 2019. Hi, I'm Christine Chenoweth, Transitional Regional Minister for the South Portion of Missouri. Hello, my name is Stephen Johnson, and I am the interim pastor of First Christian Church of Fayette, Missouri. I started in November of 2018. Hi, I'm Reverend Gina Johnson, and I was ordained in the Disciples of Christ Church January 26th of this year, and I was blessed to answer the call to be the senior minister at First Christian Church in Warrensburg in February.
Hi, I'm Dan Kircher. I'm pastor at the Plattsburgh First Christian Church in Plattsburgh, Missouri, and I began my ministry in May of 2018. My name is Christy Love and I am the lead pastor at the Connecting Grounds Church in Springfield, Missouri. We are so excited to have kind of been adopted in and grafted into the region um, over the last few months and we are really looking forward to getting to know everybody and building relationships as sibling churches in Christ. I'm Daryl McDaniel. I'm part-time pastor at Walnut Street Christian Church here in Springfield, Missouri. I've uh, been pastor here since January the 5th of 2020. Hi, I'm Jeff Moore, pastor of Webster Grove Christian Church and new interim pastor of Memorial Boulevard Christian Church. Hi, I'm Bill Nichols, and I'm proud to serve as the minister of the Bolivar First Christian Church since June of 2013. Hi, I'm Reverend Seth Rash, and I was excited to be called as the Associate Minister of Youth and Family at First Christian Church in Troy, Missouri in August of 2018. Good morning, disciples. I'm Ron Rutledge, and I began as Regional Minister in November of 2018. And I office out of my home here in Brookfield, Missouri, so grateful to be serving this region. God bless you. Hi, I'm Reverend Hannah Ryan, and I've been serving as one of the pastors of Olivet Christian Church in Columbia, Missouri since August 2018. I'm a fifth generation disciple of Christ, and I'm the pastor here at Montgomery City Christian Church in Montgomery City, Missouri. I was called to serve on August 2018. Hi, I am Reverend Jason Williams, and I was called to serve the First Christian Church of Sykes in Missouri in August of 2020. Disciple friends, thank you for joining us for this most, shall we call it, historic regional assembly. We are coming to you virtually, thanks to so many that made this event happen. This meeting has come together as a testimony to our work together as a region. I've been glad to serve these last two years as your moderator. In this time, there has been much change on our regional staff. There has been much change in our churches. But that is the nature of church, even in this October 2020. I'm here to share some of the work that the regional board has been about on your behalf. What a good group of people on our regional board gathering several times a year to make ministry and mission a priority in Mid-America. My time is limited here, and when I speak of we, I speak of the regional board. Here are some things that you need to know. Let's talk regional ministers for a moment. Wow, in five years of being one region, we have had a complete turnover in regional ministry. There is currently not one who is carried over from the former region or former areas. That natural evolution of tenures, the retirement, the resignations, moves to other places has now produced a group that is living into the one region with shared leadership different than ever before. 
We currently have three regional ministers. In each one's call, there it was intentionality in the use of their gifts of ministry in a region like ours. They are each located in places where they can maximize travel and connection. Long gone are the days of a regional minister in an office. Their office is their cell phone, their laptop computer, their car. Their office is the Zoom meeting with you. Their office is where you are located. Their office is your church and mine. Maybe a local restaurant or a coffee shop. I would like to say that it would be easy to have four regional ministers again. I cannot say that one way or the other. We have not been able to afford that model and still operate in the black for some time. We feel we need to be better stewards of our shared fund. And so for now, for the next 18 to 24 months, we are in a time of transition, a time of visioning, a time of evaluation, a time that your input will be needed. We've called our transitional regional minister, Christine Chenoweth, to join regional ministers Paul Koch and Ron Rutledge in shepherding the region. In this transition, we will look closely at what kind of staffing we need, the staffing we can fund, and the utilization of all our gifts in the work of the region's ministry and mission, that we would be connected to the general church. Now, are you left without a regional minister? The answer is no. We ask, though, that you let go of the old boundaries, the boundaries of geography that were four areas or quadrants, and be open to the whole. The whole of the region with 236 congregations shepherded by three ministers and a number of staff members. We've separated out the vital work of the Regional Commission on Ministry to contract staff person, Reverend Catherine Kinneman, who has expertise in that area and the ability to lead that critical work. This shift allows one of our regional ministers much more time to be connected to congregations and clergy. Three regional ministers can and will be able to drive to you. Now we know that is after COVID. Until then, they are available to you. In fact, more so than before, the three. The three will help you with your search and call process, clergy care, mission connection, vital ministry initiatives, and much more. When these two years of transition and visioning are complete, it is our hope we have a better understanding of the leadership we need, the leadership we want, and can be good stewards in the process. Our current regional ministers are at the ready. They share a love for congregations and pastors. They know of the wider church. They have a passion for justice, vitality, and care. Call on them. We have divided the map of the region in such a way that still has some geographic identity I don't think we'll ever get away from it. But new lines have been drawn. New connections are being made based on where concentrations of congregations are located and the location of a regional minister. In the west is Ron Rutledge. In the east, including St. Louis, is Paul Koch. And there is an imaginary belt line across the state of Missouri. Think Highway 70, but south of it, the whole south, border to border, Christine Channel. And if you are in the old, southern, eastern portion of the region, you are now connected to Christine, the minister in the south. After five years as one region, we have looked at our bylaws and found places where it has been difficult to live out some staffing dynamics, especially the ones in regard to equal regional ministry uh, team members. The business portion of today's meeting will, uh, of this assembly will address these changes to best allow our regional ministers to function as a team, a shared ministry for the whole region. During the last six months, we have seen Ron and Paul do ministry differently. We went from four ministers to two and then online completely. They continue to lead us well. They have told Christine of our ministry and she has now joined them. We have learned much about how to do ministry differently in these days. That ability for openness and change, that flexibility will serve us well in the years to come. Our staff members in the two offices, Jenny Brown and Susan Moore, continue to serve the region. 
In keeping with a model of ministry that other regions have shared with us, we have changed their titles to ministry associate to better reflect the scope of their work. Where are those offices located? Well, the names of the regional offices have been changing over the years. We think we finally might have it right. First, let's talk about it's not ge geography of East and West, but instead the city that the office is related to. Remember, Jesus did not place or name offices. We have to remember that in church, don't we? So we find flexibility in the place and names that we use. So using the city name seems to be the best fit for our current structure, the St. Louis office, Susan Moore, Ministry Associate, the Springfield office, Jenny Brown, Ministry Associate. All regional ministers and contract staff office out of both locations, utilizing the staff and resources of both locations. More specifically, Susan in St. Louis works with regional communication and finances. Jenny in Springfield works with clergy records and commissions. They specialize in these areas, but both do so much more. Let's talk money for a few moments. Treasurer Tom Wood works hard at, to, to best interpret our funding, our expenses, and our money management. He has a keen eye for detail, and we are thankful. Uh, frankly, we will tell you funding is down, but I don't know any churches that do not understand that reality. This is not news to you or me. Despite fewer dollars, we still strive to make your congregation aware of the vital connection and shared ministry of this region. For our clergy, our mission groups, our campers, ARPR, clergy care, your giving makes all these things possible. In recent years, we established an annual fund to create a new funding stream to augment our contributions from the Disciples Mission Fund and Congregational Giving. So many of you have given over and above to the annual fund. We thank you. If you've not considered it in past days, we invite you to do so in current days. When I think of Mid-America, there are places where good disciples in churches have shaped me. I wonder if that's your story. For me, it was Festus and Canton, Hannibal, Louisiana and Columbia, Orchard Crest Camp, the Rickman Center and Jaota Camp, Culver Stockton College. What towns and churches would you name? I know that I am a disciple because of the people who lived out the gospel the best they knew how in those times and in those places. When we gather at an assembly, I am reminded of those people always. Today, I am reminded of their witness and will remember them still. Will you think on your times and places in this region and give thanks today for the long witness that we share? We look forward to a time where we can be together in person, gathering for an assembly, to be excited again about getting to go to church camp, to know of a cluster hymn sing that we can actually come and sing. There is a road that is neglected because we have not been able to travel on it together in quite some time. Those times and places will come again. We will make ready the ministry to be disciples together again. And in the meantime, we will watch a lot of activity on screens and send more emails, maybe even use the old telephone. In these ways of connection, the strength of disciples in mid-America has not and will not change. We have found again and again that we are better together. You, here today, speaks of that goodness. Thank you. We now turn to the items of business for this regional assembly, and so the business agenda is now uh, gathered before us, you have found uh, that in your docket, and uh, as you connect to the regional website uh, to find the docket, um, look for the business agenda. Items of business uh, today are the election and installation of the slate of board and ARCOM, that's the Regional Commission on Ministry Members and Leaders. Uh, the people in both groups, uh, the, the regional board and Regional Commission on Ministry, uh, many are carrying over into another term, and you're voting on all of them. 
and then also new members, specifically Madeline Haraway from Compton Heights Christian Church in St. Louis to be moderator elect. Nancy Baus, a uh, member at First Christian Church in Sedalia to be board secretary. Hannah Ryan from Olivet Christian Church in Columbia to be a member at large, a director of the board. And Michael Williams to serve on the Regional Commission on Ministry. Those are the new names uh, to the names that have uh, carried over from this last two years. The second uh, order of business for this assembly is changes to the bylaws of the region. And as we have explained in uh, town hall gatherings ar around this issue, and then also in your docket, there is an explanation at the bottom of the business agenda. Uh, after five years of living out the uh, life and bylaws of the Mid-America region, uh, the Christian Church of Mid-America, uh, we have, we, the board and the regional minister team uh, together have identified some areas that need changing with language. And so here they are. Here are the recommendations from the regional board to the regional assembly. In Article 3, Section 1 shall now read, the regional board shall be composed of the following voting members, moderator, moderator-elect, the past moderator, the secretary, the treasurer, and the directors. All members of the regional minister team shall be non-voting ex officio members of the regional board. Article 6, Section 1, Part D shall now read, the past moderator. The past moderator shall be an ex officio voting member of the personnel committee, assist the moderator and moderator-elect in presiding at the business sessions of the assembly and the regional board, and assume other responsibilities as may be assigned by these bodies. Article 6, Section 1, Part E shall now read, a regional minister team member shall serve as corporate president to be renewed each year. Article 4, Section 5, Part D. The references to office of the regional minister team leader shall be changed to one of the offices of the regional minister team. Article 4, Section 6, the reference to the regional minister team leader shall be changed to a member of the regional minister team. These changes to the bylaws, the nominations on the slate of board and ARCOM members and leaders are uh, ready for your voting. The treasurer's financial report and the moderator's state of the union, uh, not state of the union, but state of the church uh, report are uh, received and do not need to be voted on. If you are a delegate and a voting, registered voting member, you received an email this morning with the ballot. We hope that you will electronically vote and send that in. The uh, email, it, it's automatic. It, you vote and it comes to us. We will have until 11.30 this morning to complete the voting. After 11.30, there will be a response and it will also be in the update this coming Wednesday uh, as to the results of the, uh, the voting and a occasion to install and bless our new uh, leaders in this uh, coming two years. Thank you for being a part of this uh, business meeting, a part of the Regional Assembly. I think it was rather short. I hope it was good for you. Uh, we have nurtured these bylaws in such a way that we will uh, hopefully together uh, be better. Thank you. Much has changed in 2020 that affect the region's financial picture beyond the effects of the pandemic. We lost two of our four regional ministers at the beginning of the year when Katrina Palin resigned and uh, Penny Roscoe Rona retired after 16 years of loyal service. Interestingly enough though, losing half of our regional ministry team gave us an opportunity to take a look at how we provide services to the congregations in the region. Ron Rutledge and Paul Koch, the remaining two regional ministers agreed to rearrange responsibilities and try as an experiment to see if we can efficiently operate with three members rather than four. Jennifer Long began service early this year as Disciples Women's Coordinator and Catherine Kinwin began as a Regional Commission on Ministry Coordinator. Uh, other than those personnel matters, other impacts affected our finances. The region had to cancel the 2020 summer camping program because of the pandemic. Small group meetings and larger educational sessions 
were conducted by Zoom instead of in person. Our search for the third regional ministry minister took several months, primarily because of the pandemic, but the Reverend Christine Chenoweth began her CCMA service in September. And indeed, this regional assembly itself is being done uh, in, in a remote, remote fashion rather than in person. The combination of cost savings has reduced our total expenses by more than 27% from last year, about $90,000 through July. The lower expenses have helped us achieve a $35,000 surplus through July. Total income for the region through July was $35,000 less than for the same period last year, or 12%. Two years ago in my report to the Regional Assembly in Hannibal, I reported that income to the region from congregations had been declining for several years, and that does continue. But it's hard to know whether this year's decline is following that trend or is caused by the pandemic. I think perhaps a little of both. Congregational support to the region is down by more than 14% from last year through July, almost $20,000. Income to the region from the Disciples Mission Fund is down by $13,000 or more than 9%. Those two income categories make up the total income shortage to the region through July. The region received a Paycheck Protection Plan loan of $90,646. This is part of the federal government's program to support employment costs, and it will be very helpful to the region's income statement for 2020, but that's a one-time benefit. Two years ago, we kicked off an annual fund, giving individual members an opportunity to personally support the mission and ministry of the region with financial gifts. Through July, church members have given about $10,000 so far this year, a similar amount to last year. The fund's name has been changed to CCMA Ministry Fund, and we hope that it can become an even more significant source of income to support the very worthwhile mission and ministry of CCMA. The region operates with the same two offices we've had since reorganization a few years ago. The Springfield office is housed at South Street Christian Church at no cost to the region. The St. Louis office will be moved soon to Webster Groves Christian Church, also at no cost to the region and that's at a savings of $4,000 per year rent. Around Rutledge and Paul Coke work from their homes. Assuming we meet our budgeted income for 2020, our total financial support of the region in 2020 will be about 8% lower than in 2016. Disciples Mission Fund, Disciples Mission Fund income will be almost 12% lower than 2016, and the congregation's financial support will be almost 16% lower. Fortunately, we have other sources of income, such as the annual fund, Christmas offering, investments, and endowment income, to bring the total income to be only about 4% lower than in 2016. But just think about it. We're able to continue operating the region's ministries on less income than five years ago. A big part of that is expense control. Because of the expense reduction so far this year, our total expenses will be in the neighborhood of 15% lower than 2019, and almost 20% lower than 2016. But we, there's an old saying that you cannot cut your way to prosperity, so we cannot continue to keep cutting costs and cutting costs uh, and still expecting to have the same type of ministry. So uh, it's very important that we all find ways to, either through ourselves or through our congregations, to financially support the region. Based on all these experiences, however, it appears we'll finish this year with a surplus, so I'm happy to report that the region's finances are indeed strong. There's revival and it's spreading like a wild.
Greetings, ladies. And when I say ladies, I mean all of the women. All of the women, whether you are Disciples Women or CWF, God's Pearls, Edna Circles, whatever you call your group. Greetings. We are women that are of the Disciples of Christ denomination. And so from our regional assembly, I say welcome. This is a different year. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Jennifer Long. I'm the associate pastor in Buffalo, Missouri at the First Christian Church. And I came on board uh, with Ron Rutledge this spring as your Disciples Woman Coordinator. Just as the COVID-19 pandemic uh, was underway. Oh my. It's been a ride. It's been a roller coaster. It's been um, so many things rolled up into one. But the one thing that is wonderful, when life throws you lemons, you make lemonade. So we've been working very hard with social media, with Zoom meetings, with uh, emails, and, and all kinds of ways of staying in touch, and that's very important nowadays. Um, we are in the middle of having monthly meetings. We are having a weekly newsletter to keep everyone informed, and sometimes a little bit of trivia or silliness. Um, we're working with a book right now. We're doing a book study, and uh, it should go on for several weeks. Get on board. Uh, talk to me or Ron. Uh, the author of the book has been uh, willing to meet us via Zoom to discuss her book. Uh, it's uh, wonderful. Um, so through this technology, we're getting by, and we're, we're uniting, and, and it's wonderful. And it's making it possible for so many of our women that have not been able to in the years due to distancing or uh, work or children, um, all kinds of different ways. But now we can meet together in the comfort of your own home. It's wonderful. Um, I'm looking forward to a time when we can be together again and physically uh, touch one another and be together. We're working on a leadership team consisting of six pillars of success. Um, Ron put together this uh, with the help of the ladies and I'd like to read them to you. It's study, service, social connections, social justice, scholarships, and stories. We are looking forward to a bright future. And just like the, uh, the Regional Assembly in, in Ecclesiastes 4.12, we are stronger together. So that's where we're at. That's where we want to be. And I, I hope you know how much you all are needed and loved. And we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. God bless you on your journeys. I look forward to seeing you on Zoom. Bye for now. Blessings. Hello, my name is Lena Eddy, and I reside in California, Missouri. I am the chairperson of the Disciple Care Team. With the assistance of Reverend Ron Rutledge, Regional Minister of the Christian Church Disciples of Christ.
The disciple care team has been in existence for many years. We have evolved a number of times and in a number of ways in Mid-America region of the Christian Church Disciples of Christ. In the beginning, the disciple care team members were a group of people who would come together twice a year for a retreat to learn about the dynamics of our congregations and pastors. The primary function of the disciple care team was that mem <clears throat> members of the disciple care team would pick the churches or assign ch churches and they would visit with those churches at least once or twice a quarter and when we met we would do a check-in. Since that time we have gone from um, 260 congregations to 237 congregations. We have realized that, that um, allowing going out to churches was not the most effective use of our time or our talents. So what has changed? Ron Rutledge and I sat down one day and looked at a number of effective ways that the disciple care team could function. During this time, we planned a new disciple of care team that would be more effective and feel um, though they were doing more effective ministry in the region. The first thing was that Ron Rutledge gave every member of the disciple care team a book, Your Calling as an Elder. We asked them to read this during the Christmas season and we would be in conversation about it at the last at the next meeting. So what else has changed? Well, there, were, uh, there are other things that have changed and currently there are 237 congregations in mid-America. Currently we have, um, we seem to call ourselves the prayer warriors and currently are following, um, following that message. If you look on the board, there's, um, that's the structure of what we're going to be looking at, what we look like now. Um, the new structure of the disciple care team is to function as prayer warriors in mid-America. We realize that nine people cannot serve mid-America region alone. The plan is that that the regional ministers, if appropriate, would call me and I would um, call on my prayer warriors and we would start preaching or praying for the congregation or the pastor who is in need of prayer. The disciple care team is making a request. We are asking that if a pastor realizes that someone would be interested to be nominated possibly as a new member of the care team that they contact either Ron Rutledge or myself, Lena Eddy, to join the care team. Finally, we would like to invite the region to continue to lift up the disciples care team in prayer as we seek to undergird the many congregations, pastors, and the ministries that go on. In Christ's name, amen. This year, camps across our region were empty. Youth didn't gather. Bunks were empty. Volunteer staff did not sweat to make food like this. Ridiculous games were not played. Like these adults never learned to shave. Naps were not taken. And whatever this is did not happen. Kids did not get dirty. And no bathrooms were cleaned. But fear not. PJs can be worn in the heat. Kids can gather in groups. And Christ will be taught. Because work is being done. Dates are being set, and camp ridiculousness and faith opportunities are being worked on for 2021. 
We will find ways to try and offer traditional camps as well as virtual. You can help by sending campers and being open to new ways of volunteering. With your help, shaving cream will not be wasted on merely shaving in 2021. You can go to our website where we will give you updates on all the events that are happening. This year, all the campers that could have signed up for camp in 2020 are in the process of receiving camp shirts so that they will never forget the hardships that 2020 brought and all of the mud that was not played in. Thank you. Good afternoon, friends. My name is Katherine Kinneman. Currently, I am the coordinator of the Mid-America Regional Commission on the Order of Ministry. The role of the commission is to oversee those individuals who are serving our congregations as clergy or who are in preparation to serve as clergy. I'm very proud to serve with my colleagues, the members of this commission. You know them. They are lay leaders and clergy commissioned and ordained in your congregations. I want to thank you for sharing them with us, their time and their gifts, their faith, and their willingness to serve in this work, which we believe is on behalf of the whole region. As part of the commission's work, we have four what we call commissioning ministry teams. These individuals, again, from your congregations, work directly with our commission ministers and those who are studying and preparing to be commissioned. In addition, we have ordination nurture teams. Each ordination nurture team serves with one candidate to guide and support them on the process toward ordination. Overall, these teams and our commission are called to nurture, support, to challenge, and to make accountable the clergy serving your congregations as well as those who are preparing for their call to serve. Our commission is committed to this work and to serve our congregations and pastors to the best of our ability. At the close of each meeting, we pray for our congregations and for our pastors and for ourselves, that together all of us will continue to serve Christ Church in Mid-America faithfully. God has blessed our region with several new church starts in recent years. In the past, the effectiveness of ministries has been measured by numbers, dollars, and buildings, but that is changing. We are concerned about individuals, connections, and prompting a spirit of inclusion within the body that leads to a measurable community impact and transformation. This process requires not only vision, but perseverance and an incredible amount of effort. We are not chasing short-term gains, but are about a long obedience in the same direction. For us, it's not size, but the breadth of diverse influence that is a more accurate measure of effectiveness. We are a dinner church, a neighborhood gathering place, an outreach to those on the margins of society, a safe place of full acceptance, those called to offer hope and tangible resources to all God's children. In our ministries, we ask God questions, listen deeply, assume the best of others. Advance faith, not fear. Acknowledge complexities and lift up the name of Jesus in all we do. As new church planters, we are keenly aware that, unless the Lord builds a house, its workers labor in vain. We praise God for the new ways we are being led to create new communities of grace and reconciliation. Please keep us in your prayers 
and join us for worship and work anytime. Amen. Hi, friends of Christian Church Mid-America. I'm Dan Kircher. I serve as pastor of the Plattsburgh First Christian Church and moderator-elect of CCMA. In May of 2020, Christian Church Mid-America formed a Visioning 2021 Task Force. I'm honored to serve as chair of the task force. We began via a Zoom meeting in June asking ourselves three questions. Why does the CCMA exist? What does it do and how does it do it? Too often when organizations are looking at themselves, they jump to the second and third questions and skip the first. But the first is the most important because it drives the answers to questions two and three. In our first call, we felt like we were able to adequately answer those questions. Now we move forward with three more questions. First, vision through prayer. What is God's leading vision direction for our re region. Number two, mutuality of covenant. How can we more fully live into our shared covenant? And three, new wine of structure. What structural changes can we implement to link, uh, link us more closely together? Regional leaders, pastors, congregations, and ministries. Our Visioning 2021 Task Force needs help. We are seeking input from the entire region to provide answers to those questions. After all, we are better together as a region. This is where you come in to make us better together. Through clergy clusters, congregational meetings, informal gatherings, and phone contact, please give us your feedback. Help us address these three questions as we move forward with visioning. More details will be coming in the update newsletter. If you do not receive the update newsletter, please subscribe. You may go to midamericadisciples.org and click on the newsletter link to subscribe. I hope to hear from you as we prayerfully enter into a covenant which continues to make us better together. Greetings, I'm Larry Colvin and I'm co mission co-worker with Global Ministries. I serve in partnership with the Evangelical Presbyterian Church, Ghana, and I serve here at the seminary in Peke, Ghana. I teach Old Testament and church studies. I wanna take you on a short tour. This is the entryway to the seminary. This gate is new and it welcomes us to the seminary. The seminary was begun in 1864 here in Pecky. Pecky was chosen because of its location. The valley affords a good water supply. It's a reasonably cooler than other parts of Ghana and it has fewer mosquitoes. This sign greets all who enter into the seminary. It always gives us that, those questions to ponder as we come into the seminary to do our work and to study. This is the student library. It also houses some of the offices for the seminary. You can see the hand washing device that's out in front for this time of COVID. And here we see the pr principal's house up on the hill. It's graced by beautiful fruit trees most of which are grapefruit. This is the vice principal's house. It is over 100 years of age, and as you can see, it is getting a new and fresh coat of paint. This is one of my favorite views at the seminary. It looks across the valley to the other side. The town is down in the valley itself, this first building is the area where students eat. This building is one of the buildings for the Department of Music. The gazebo on campus is one of the gathering places, sometimes used for classes, 
Sometimes students go there to study. Sometimes it's just a nice place to rest. These are the classrooms. This building is also over 100 years old. And this is the vice principal of the seminary and he'll share just briefly what the group is. Uh, this, group, this group is the a newly commissioned group, the newly commissioned pastors of the Evangelical Presbyterian Church. Um, they were commissioned on the 28th of uh, June here, yeah, and uh, this is um, an orientation session that you're having with them. Okay, thank you. Please continue with your class. Thank you very much. <laughs> All right. <laughs> yeah. I love it. Uh, and me. But you see, that is the reason. So, so we all agree. But in course of discussion, sir, um, some, some of your colleagues say, okay, fine. Uh, that being the case, in order not to bring any confusions. Uh, here we are inside of the chapel. No students are here at the present time. But when this is in use, it's a wonderful place to be. It is really the center of our campus. Here we have worship each morning, Wednesday evening, and on Sunday. There's a lot of lively singing at our worship, not only because the students enjoy singing, but because of our music department, which includes choir, band, individuals, uh, every time that we have worship, there is a time of great singing, joy, and often dancing. This is our house. It's quite comfortable and much larger than we actually need. It has a large living room, dining room area, a small kitchen, five bedrooms, and two bathrooms. As you can see, we do have television. So that means we have electricity. We also have cold running water. We take two to three showers a day in the cold water and enjoy it because of the heat in this climate. Hello, this is Debbie Colvin, mission co-worker with Global Ministries serving in Peki, Ghana, Africa with the Evangelical Presbyterian Church, Ghana. This morning I'm on my way to work at the Pecky Government Hospital in Pecky, and I will show you some of the highlights of the hospital. As you can see down the hallway here, to our left is the waiting area for the patients when I want to see by physician. Here on the left are the physician's rooms. On the other side of this is the laboratory and the uh, x-ray. Straight ahead is the mail ward. In the mail ward, they have um, a 10 bed medical unit, a 10 bed surgical unit, and an ICU unit. To your right are theaters. The theater is what we call a United States surgical. There's two entrances into the surgical room, and they have two surgery suites. Down further from there is the laundry facility. And all of these outlying buildings here are housing for staff. I am leaving work now. And this is the road that leads up to the hospital. And here on the right are some traders that are along the road. This is basically how you're shopping, where your shopping is done in Pepe. They have anywhere from Fruits, vegetables, um, oils, water, bread, pots and pans, clothing. But these are all along the way on the road to and from work. A Hammock of Hands by Elena Hegel. Treque, or barter, is a long economic tradition of the original peoples of Mexico, and it is still very much alive today at all levels of society. No money is exchanged, but it means that together we arrange for you to do me a favor, knowing that someday you will call in that favor 
and then I will do something for you. My sister-in-law's friend from medical school in Guadalajara, who turned rural junior high school principal and then top-level fashion designer, he recently designed the dress for Miss Mexico in the Miss Universe competition, says life is all about weaving relationships. He explains that it is his choice to knit his life to the lives of others that has led him to extraordinary places and people. He lives by the ancient vision of Trueque, that we all need each other while having something to offer, and that it is endearing to accept mutual indebtedness that we intertwine strong and significant relationships. This week, I practiced the tradition of Trueque. The gardener at the Institute for Intercultural Study and Research asked if I would make him five cloth face coverings. He said, I could buy them, but I like the way you paint, and I would like for my masks to be unique. I don't have a sewing machine, so it meant that I would have to hand sew and paint the masks. He asked, what would you like in return? And I knew I had to honor his dignity by accepting his invitation for us to be in relationship. I asked him if he would be willing to trade the masks for two hammock hooks hung from the overhang on the patio at my house. We agreed on the trade. I worked a week on the masks and he came one afternoon and spent a couple of hours chiseling the holes, bending iron rods and cementing the hooks. We both used materials we had on hand and both of us were satisfied with the results. Our relationship is a bit stronger. Our trust is a bit deeper. As I lay in my hammock enjoying the hummingbirds flicking around the feeders, I like to think of our ministry together, Global Ministries, the Mid-America Congregations, and our overseas partners, such as the Institute for Intercultural Studies and Research, where I serve as, the, as a hammock of hands, weaving, giving and receiving, trust and understanding, respect for differences while recognizing our common dignity. We are truly better, stronger, and wiser when we discover ways to be together. Hammock of hands. We weave a net with all our hands to catch hope and let fear escape. A handy net to cradle the world. Bring your hands, your working hands with cracked nails, your folded hands, praying at the rail, your grubby hands with sand, shovel, and pail, your manicured hands with sculpted nails. Together we weave a hammock of hands to gently rock the world. Laughter and babbling brook gather in the net. Hunger, hate, and horror shake, shake, shake them out. Hummingbirds and wild flowers gather in the net. Word blows and worries. Shake, shake, shake them out. Child play and simple joy gather in the net. Snake, fang, and heart pain shake, shake, shake them out. Bear hugs and skipping rope gather in the net. Floating gossip and ignorance shake, shake, shake them out. Cradle the world in a hammock of interwoven hands. Greetings, church. What a difficult time it has been for many of us, as we can't physically be together for worship, meals, communion, and regional gatherings. I am grateful that despite the difficult situation, we continue to be the church and continue to be in relationship and care for one another. Week of Compassion is your compassion at work around the world, around the year. As the Relief, Refugee, and Development Mission Fund of our church, Week of Compassion has been even more active during this pandemic as we continue to work with partners to alleviate suffering caused by COVID-19. Together, we share the presence of our wider church with people in need in many places at once. In the midst of a global pandemic, disciples' congregations including many of you, as well as our global partners, have been working to respond to the crisis. From feeding ministries through local churches, to long-term food sustainability programs around the world for vulnerable families and refugees, your gifts have been supporting urgent 
critical needs while also preparing for the next crisis. Because disasters continue to happen even during a pandemic, affecting families and communities. In August, a severe windstorm called a derecho damaged church buildings of multiple disciple congregations in Iowa and affected the members and neighbors of many more. Fires continued to burn across California, and an explosion in Beirut devastated the lives of many. As we are recording this message, damage assessments are underway in Texas and Louisiana in the wake of Hurricane Laura. In addition to these recent events, recovery efforts are ongoing from disasters that occurred over the past several years, as communities in the Mid-America region well know. From the tornado recovery ongoing in Jefferson City to the flood recovery still ongoing in Mound City, communities are continuing the work of rebuilding and finding new normals. All of these responses and recoveries have been complicated by the pandemic. Because of the faithfulness and generosity of disciples past and present, Week of Compassion has been able to continue responding to these multiple crises. Through our COVID-19 relief grants, we've been able, as disciples, to provide direct assistance to more than 650 disciple households experiencing extreme financial hardship because of the pandemic. We've also partnered with 45 congregations and ministries who are feeding their neighbors during this time. The needs continue to be great as we work together to help our sisters and brothers impacted by disasters and by this pandemic. And because you, disciples, continue to be generous, we continue to better meet the urgent needs of this time while planning ahead for the future. Together, our global presence meets needs and embodies transformative hope. When we hear these voices speak in gratitude, we know that they represent so many more whose lives have been impacted by your compassion. Thank you, and keep up the good work, Church. Big thank you to Week of Compassion from the board members of Caminamos Juntos. Your gift means so much and has enabled us to continue to offer hope and stability to all our participants. Thank you, thank you. Thanks to the support of Week of Compassion, we can provide more families with food and respect for their rights during this pandemic. Thanks to the support from Week of Compassion, I am able to keep my job during the pandemic. Thank you. Gracias. Thank you so much. Welcome to the worshipful part of the Regional Assembly. We close today's uh, proceedings with a time around the table. We are disciples, and it's as close to us as the table before us. We hope that you found a table, gathered some elements of communion, and found yourself in a place and in a spirit of prayer and of communion. Today's opening, the invitation, the affirmation of communion, is found in our Chalice Hymnal, number 401. It's the words of Alexander Campbell. We know him well, one of our disciples for bearers. As I offer the words and as they are uh, shared with you, uh, we invite you to respond. You, my beloved, once an alien, are now a citizen of heaven. Once a stranger are now brought home to the family of God. You have owned my Lord as your Lord, my people as your people. Under Jesus the Messiah, we are one, mutually embraced in the everlasting arms. I embrace you in mine. Your sorrows shall be my sorrows, 
and your joys my joys. Joint debtors to the favor of God and the love of Jesus, we shall jointly suffer with him, that we may jointly reign with him. Let us then renew our strength, remembering our God, and hold fast our boasted hope unshaken to the end. We now invite you to sing as you are able, the words will come before your screen, to the hymn that is connected to this invitation and affirmation. When you do this, remember me. If you have the chalice hymnal, it's number 400. Your regional ministers, Ron, Paul, and I are so glad to gather at the table with you today. For some of us, it's been a long time, hasn't it? Yet we've come to appreciate all of the creative options for celebrating Eucharist, communion, the Lord's Supper, the richness of the silence as we break bread alone the curious connectedness of meeting by Zoom, the careful gathering by social distance, inside, outside, breaking bread, lifting the cup in ways that work for this place and this time and these circumstances. I'm coming to you today from the beautiful sanctuary in the round at South Street Christian Church in Springfield, Missouri. South Street has a profound and long ministry with our region providing office space for us on the third floor here. We're appreciative of all they do for the region and I'm appreciative of their daily day in and day out ministry to me as I come and go. And I'd like to show you this beautiful loaf of bread that we're using for communion today. It was made by a local baker. I asked her to braid together strands of dough to make this loaf representative of our gathering today and of our theme, Stronger together. Isn't it beautiful? And aren't we beautiful in God's eyes as we gather in all the ways we will gather this weekend 
around the table of our Savior. At a camp on the Guadalupe River where I've spent many summers, we sing this blessing at mealtime each day. Hear these words of song as our invitation to Holy Communion today. Back of the bread is the grain, and back of the grain is the mill, and back of the mill is the wind and the rain, and the Creator's will. On the night that Jesus was given for us, he took bread, gave thanks for it, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat. This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. I was a vintner for five years. We had 150 yards of grapes. So what does one do with that many grapes? Well, you make wine, of course. This was my only experience with agriculture. But in that short time that we lived where we did, I learned many important faith lessons. I knew to be connected to the land was incredibly important, to tend and to garden. I learned how fragile the weather is and the seasons are to the crops. I learned about all the hard work that is necessary for pruning and the whole process it takes to go from grape to bottle. As these are Norton grapes, I found out that that grape only grows in Missouri and North Carolina, and so I celebrated the heritage of the people who brought the vines over from Europe, who protected them during Prohibition. So I invite you to come to this table, but come with your appreciation for the land, for the stewardship of harvest, for the climate, for the weather, for your heritage, and especially for each other. For on the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took the cup and he poured into it, saying, This is the new covenant of my blood, which is poured for the remission of your sins. As often as you take the bread and drink from the cup, you proclaim my death and resurrection until I come again. Take and drink. Having received the gifts of God, let us give thanks for these gifts. Everlasting God, we join with your church in all times and places to thank you for creating us in your image, caring for us who are only human. When we marred your image through sin, you mercifully did not hold it against us, but gave of yourself sacrificially in Christ Jesus, that we may become like him. Formed into the body of Christ, we praise you for restoring us to the joy of your salvation. Nourished by holy food and drink from Christ's table, strengthen us by your spirit to present ourselves to the world as living sacrifices, holy and acceptable to you. Amen. God's love shines in the west, in the south, and in the east. God lives through the Creator and the Christ and the Holy Spirit. God's work is accomplished in our local congregation, our region, and in the general church. In God's blessing received in this regional assembly, we now leave. Or we log off, individually energized. But we remain united in the spirit, better, better together. together.